Welcome to the Woman Who Rubs the Mountain podcast, a gathering place for stories and conversations of ecological embodiment. I am your host and guide, Kendra Ward. So let's just take a moment to set the spell of intention for our time together here. Our explorations begin with this single question. What happens when we rub on the body of the earth? How does it brush back against us? Here we seek an intimacy with the land and beings where we live, an intimacy that transcends language, culture, species, even consciousness. Let us come together in creative, strange, disruptive ways of relating beyond the human-centric limitations of our current dreaming. By sharing experiences of embodied ecology, our reality shifts, our core truths sharpen, and space is made for a new old earth-honoring culture to reemerge. To me, each of these conversations is a little like this, this gift, this little offering placed on this great altar to Mother Earth and to all of her or their wide, unseeable, but tremendously vast, wild knowing. So I'm here today sharing this space with Hilary Giovale. Hilary is a mother, dancer, writer, philanthropist, and community organizer who lives next to a sacred mountain of kinship on Diné, Hopi, Havasupai, and Apache land. A ninth generation American settler, she is descended from Celtic, Germanic, Nordic, and indigenous peoples of ancient Europe. For most of her life, these origins were obscured by the delusion of whiteness. In her early 40s, 40, an unexpected, unexpected series of ancestral interventions changed everything. After learning more about her ancestors, Hillary found herself emerging from a fog of amnesia and denial. For the first time, she saw a painful reality. Over many generations, her family's occupation of this continent has harmed indigenous and African peoples, cultures, and life ways. She faced the shadows of colonialism and began an inquiry. How can I become a good relative? Hillary lives into this question as an act of love for the ancestors, the waters and future generations. She is committed to divesting from whiteness and bridging historic divides with truth-telling, apology, reparations, and forgiveness. She follows indigenous leadership in support of human rights, environmental justice, equitable futures, and mutual healing. The author of a forthcoming book, her website is called goodrelative.com. And I originally discovered Hillary's work through her website, Good Relative, which is just a tremendous treasure trove of resource, both of her own writing and of many others. So I really highly recommend after the interview today that you go and check it out and just explore this generous gathering of wisdom that she has there. So Hillary, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you, Kendra. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, wonderful. Let's just orient in space through story and through place. We know that there are stories in the land wherever we are. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a story about how the place where you live informs you, particularly through a sense of sacred landscape. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, as you just read in that bio, I live next to a sacred mountain of kinship. And this land where I live is sacred to many indigenous nations of the region. And this mountain, in particular is, a, is an especially sacred being to those cultures. Now, when I first moved here, you know, I grew up in a middle-class white settler family. Um, I had no idea about sacred landscape. I had never heard that term before. And I moved here to come to college when I was 18. And I didn't know who I was plopping down next to, you know? <laughs> wow. Um, but over the, over the years, I have developed a relationship with this mountain 
I've developed it by spending time out in the woods and walking around. And in recent years, especially, I've developed a relationship with this sacred landscape through my relationships with the indigenous peoples of this region. And I've done that through various ways. Um, one of the ways that those relationships have taken shape is by supporting their community organizing that is you know, indigenous led community organizing to protect the sacred mountain as well as many other aspects of life in our community for the indigenous members of our community. Um, so in spending time with, with that indigenous community over the years, I've heard one after the other of stories and prayers and songs and um, the importance of this mountain. And through their guidance and leadership, I have been able to learn how to forge a relationship with this place that is different than what I would have been able to understand or comprehend if I was just falling back on my own, you know, white settler uh, worldview that I came in with. Um, so, you know, I've learned to make offerings to this land. I've learned to sing to the mountain, to pray to the mountain, to honor the mountain. Um, and in exchange, there's been quite an incredible um, body of relational healing, I guess you could call it, that has developed from that, from that process. And um, sometimes there are things that happen in my life that are almost unbelievable. You almost can't even believe it. Um, and when I, when I take a step back and go, well, how is this happening? My indigenous friends will tell me, well, you live next to a mountain of kinship. And this is what she does. She weaves connections and she makes things happen. She creates networks. And so I could share a story if, if that would be helpful to illustrate what I'm talking about. Please. One example of this is um, one of the peaks of this mountain currently is called Agassiz Peak. It was named after a man named uh, Louis Agassiz, who was a naturalist and a, you know, a scientist in the 1800s. He had a very, from what I understand, he had a, a well-developed understanding of the natural world, but he was also a perpetrator of racist pseudoscience. And he took photos of enslaved people. At that time, they were you know, a very early form of photography that resulted in daguerreotypes that are held currently by Harvard University. He took photos of these people in an extremely dehumanizing way. And he used these daguerreotypes and the, the measurements and the, the study that he did on them, of course, without their consent, um, as a way of proving their racial inferiority. His name is on one of the peaks of the sacred mountain of kinship. And on that same peak is a ski resort that is manufacturing snow out of reclaimed sewage water to extend their ski season and to make more money in the face of the climate change that's making skiing much less profitable. So you can see it's ripe what's with it, yes, <laughs> it's it's ripe for for change. Mm. So um, last summer, I received an email from someone I didn't know, and by way of introduction, she said, "Oh, here's an article about what I've been up to," and it just so happened that she is the third great granddaughter of Louis Agassiz. Wow! And it just so happened that. The next day, I think it was, or maybe that day, there was a group of indigenous youth who um, had a, you know, a press release in the paper saying, announcing their int intention to change the name of so-called Agassiz Peak. Mm. So you can see how 
the mountain is putting all of us in relationship and connection to each other. So just last week, we had a meeting with members of the Agassiz family, a member of the family that uh, from which the enslaved people were photographed, a descendant of, of one of the enslaved men who was photographed at Harvard mm -hmm. and the indigenous youth who were working to change the name. And so there are things like this that happen all the time where I couldn't orchestrate these things if I tried, but I think that the land where we live and the being with whom we live, when we pay attention to her and when we honor her as she's supposed to be honored, she helps us make these things happen. Mm -hmm. So um, that's just one example of several. And I feel incredibly blessed by her presence and also by the relationships with the first peoples of this region that are able, they're so generously offering to help me understand how this works because I wouldn't know otherwise. Hmm. So that's, that's a little story. <laughs> Beautiful story and so relevant and timely. And I, I love how it's, it's just percolating in this way, you know, in the, in your, in your current moment, um, just out of total curiosity, thinking back to I mean, do you think it was just total chance that you ended up in this place? Or do you think that something unconsciously within you drew you there? Or, um, you know, just, just really curious about how that happened. Yeah, I wonder. Uh -huh. I, in some way, I almost think that it was probably a destiny that I couldn't possibly understand when I was 18 years old. Yeah. And, you know, um, but but I've always stayed, even though it was a huge shock at first because I was, I came from Southern California and I missed the malls and the beaches. <laughs> but now I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I understand what a, what a honor to be able to uh, also, she, she sounds like she is, um, really an active communicate like the humans around her are really actively honoring her versus you know many mountains are don't have that kind of it, there's not that ceremony and ritual and ongoing connection so it sounds like she's very alive which is lovely um alive in that yeah. way of like like you said like actively really weaving um versus in yeah. a deep sleep so mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, so many of the, the traditional practitioners are still here and they are still, you know, practicing their cultural ways with this mountain. So, yeah. and, and still they're not able to do as much as they would like because it's forest service land, it's private land, and they don't have the access that they used to have. So it's both and. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thinking about this, um, this sense of creating intimacy, finding intimacy in the place where we are, I seem to return over and over again to the sense of, of haptic wisdom, this like this touching. Just the other day, I, I came across, um, I was on a, a hike and as I got to sort of the alpine layer, there there's these beautiful like nubs of moss on everything. It was like, touch me, it was screaming out. It was, it was so pretty. Um, but just really thinking about using our senses as a way of staying awake. And I was hoping that we might dive into this idea of staying awake a little bit further. Um, what that means to you in a world that is always vying to cover up our colonialist history or distract us in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely, um, I found that that is almost like a sacred commitment that I have to make all the time. Because when I go out into the world around me, into the mainstream culture, everything is conspiring to keep us asleep and in denial of that. And it's, it's very painful to look at. It's painful for everybody to look at it whether, you know, no matter what your ancestors situation was, all of us, I feel 
all of us are carrying pain from the way things came together and transpired to create this nation. And many of us, the pain is under the radar and we've numbed it out and we're in denial about it, but it's still there <laughs> because mm-hmm. that, that history hasn't been spoken about. It hasn't been addressed on a, on a broad scale yet. It's not okay to talk about that yet. It's, it's still rather taboo in a lot of circles, I would say. So, um, yeah, I, I just... I hold that as a, as a practice to commit myself to staying awake. And one of the ways that I'm able to do that is by sitting on the land, you know, and um, going out, lying down on the ground, spending time under the trees, being completely silent, sometimes for days or hours at a time, sometimes, you know, just for a hike, but um, it's like the land is the one that gives me the the resource inside to be able to follow through with that commitment of staying awake to the difficulty of the settler colonialist state that we're in and, and the legacy of all that's happened here and continues to happen. So that's really, I'm really grateful for for the forest here, for the streams and the creeks and the mountain, because if I didn't have the ability to go out and spend time in those places, I don't, it would be much harder to stay awake. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And also lately my practice has been um, staying awake through what is available to all of us all the time, even if someone's not, even if someone's in a, in a very human impacted space um, through like the chi, the life force moving through a branch from the wind, you know, or like, like just even doing a mentorship with the clouds. You know, I think that there are all these um, beings all around us that, um, you know, we don't even, we don't even have to be somewhere really quiet also to, to just remember like this practice, this sensory practice can be everywhere, um, no matter where we mm. are, but you're right. It is, it, it is ongoing an ongoing devotion, a fidelity, a returning, um, it is repetitive. So yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, working with this theme of um, tuning in through the body, whether it be through senses or touch. In in some of your writings, you talk about how our social conditioning makes it tempting to want to rush into into doing something, fixing something, um, making ourselves feel better in some way. And uh, that the first step in bridging the colonial divide can simply be really feeling into the discomfort, the true history of colonialization. So I was hoping that you might speak about this a little bit further, not just through the mind, um, but but also through the body as well, when we're having feelings arise of grief or defensiveness, um, hopelessness, you know, when we settle into a place where we're just really lost. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, this path started for me, it had many different uh, entrance points, but one of the entrance points was starting to work with an ancestor altar and, you know, lighting a candle, pouring a bowl of water, um, lighting up some dry ice to release the smoke and, I work with uh, juniper and lavender and mugwort and things like that. And um, there was something about the that act of ritual that was very important in um, staying with it and and not ha- having the grounding to not jump try to jump into action or jumping into fixing it. Um, 
you know, what I've, what I've come to realize over time is that we can't fix it. It's, it's so big. The harm that's happened here is so profound that, that there is no fixing it. But what there is, is um, the effort and the grace of trying to reduce the harm. So that's one of my practices when I set up my altar is um, letting those tears flow, letting that grief be fully expressed and not, I don't, I don't take it into the, you know, the community organizing spaces that I'm in, for example, because the folks I'm working with already have buckets of grief that they're carrying. So I'm trying to not um, spread, spread my stuff around, <laughs> but I'm, I'm working with it with my ancestors and with the land. And as you said, there's so many things that can be done, even if you don't have access to a forest nearby. It can be in the bathtub, it can be in the corner of your room with a candle um, and a small altar, very simple. Um, it can be with a potted plant on your windowsill or looking at the clouds. But, you know, to, to let those feelings flow, in my experience, that's one of the wounds that we as Euro-descended people have sustained through this process of settler colonialism, is that we've, generation after generation, our people have stuffed it down. We've stuffed it down and we've made the best of it and kept our chins up and tried to keep going, right? Instead of actually stopping and looking at what we've done here. Because looking at what we've done can be completely overwhelming. And, um, and because we can't, because it's so big that it can't be fixed, we tend to just either move on and ignore it or try to jump in and fix it. And there, there's a third way, which is sitting with it. Like, like you just mentioned, um, sitting with it and letting it change us, you know? And that's, that's kind of been my practice is, is letting it change me. And not to say that the action doesn't happen. I'm always returning, going through that spiral and moving back into action and then back into the internal world and then back into action. Um, but that, that work on the inside has to happen first. It has to influence what comes out on the outside or else we're just gonna be creating more of the same uh, wounding, you know? We can just keep the same cycles of trauma and harm if we do that internal work. Does that answer the question? I kind of got lost. <laughs> No, actually, I really, I really, really appreciate your description. Um, almost like it, it's almost more than a circling; it's almost a spiraling. The you know the way you're describing sort of this process of of the internal landscape, and then it kind of spiraling outwards. So you know, um, gathering the energy through um, through working it within and then moving it out into the world. I think that that's really beautiful, but I, um, I just really appreciate your willingness to let down the barriers of the heart. You know, I think that um, we have, and for good reason, the world is, is pretty overwhelming, you know, so we have so many protections up, but that being said, you know, those protections can start to mean that we just don't really ever let it in like we don't let it change us we don't let it impact us in the ways that we need it to um and you know just just continuing to work through and and let it metabolize like let it work through us i have this sense of you know in in you sharing um just letting those those tears go 
this sense of, you know, not only does it cleanse us, but that there, there's this organicness, this flow, this movement to it, you know, that it's able to, to move through instead of be stuck and festering and unlooked at. Um, so, you know, thinking about the body itself, I mean, it's enough to what you described, um, you know, how do we, how do we move it through the body? I think is the, that continued question for me. And it may be that I never, that there's no like perfect answer per se around that, but I'm wondering if you had anything else to share specifically about, about the body itself. Yeah, actually, I think I kind of forgot that part of the question, but (laughs) I'm glad you brought it back. Um, One thing that I have found, and this has been shared with me by many mentors, is the power of um, sound, rattles, drums, dancing, rolling on the floor, wailing, a really embodied um, practice. And sometimes there can be places we can go to do that in a group with other people that's safe. And other times, like a lot of mine, I've done on my own. And it works really well. Um, I remember one time I was I was receiving uh, trauma based treatment therapy treatment, and the therapist was like, "You know, you're a dancer, so you already have everything you need to to heal this trauma. Just just go wail and writhe and roll on the floor and thrash and flail around and." Don't, it doesn't need to be pretty. Doesn't need to be a choreography. Just, just do it. Just move your body and punch the air and kick your legs and whatever you need to do. And he was so right. Mm. And that's, there have been many, many times on my journey with decolonization and ancestral healing, etc., where I've had to do that. And, and it's, it's ugly. It's not something that I would necessarily want others to see, (laughs) but that's, that's one of the reasons it works so well. Mm. And I've also worked a lot with, you know, just, just light percussion, like playing a rattle and singing a chant. Um, I've been able to work with some teachers who, you know, have taught me some simple songs in Irish and Gaelic, which are some of my ancestral languages. And that is incredibly healing to sing in the old languages of our people. Um, so all of that, all that goes together for me. Yeah. You know, beautiful. Yeah. That reminds me very much of, you know, Peter Levine's work in terms of trauma and, um, this sense of, you know, animals just like shaking out their whole body all of a sudden, you know, is there that release of trauma and tension through the muscles and yeah, dance is, it's similar in a way. So thank you for that reminder. Cause um, yeah, that really resonates and you're right. It doesn't have to be pretty. <laughs> it just is, <laughs> it just comes out of its own accord. So yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. Well, um, when we're, when we're thinking about disrupting the root causes of systemic harm, Sometimes it can just feel, I mean, really feeling into the, the depth of that, it can feel like it requires a death to the world as we know of it, not just around us, but also potentially within us. And at times it feels impossible or just entirely overwhelming. And so I'm wondering what brings you hope or stabilizes you or perhaps untethers you and doesn't stabilize you at all in this death process that we're in? Yeah. Well, that's, it's such a good question. I have found when, when I started confronting the legacy of colonialism in my family, because I had ancestors on one side who came here in 1739 from Scotland. And one of my you know, great, great, great grandfathers received a grant of stolen land in North Carolina. And then his grandson went down to Mississippi where he enslaved people. And several generations after him also enslaved people. And when I began confronting that, I found 
amongst my white community that many of us are not ready to talk about that and are feel very threatened by that. And I felt threatened by it too. And I think what it does is that it, it threatens the mythology of who we were raised to be. You know, we were raised to be patriotic, upstanding citizens in this great land of freedom where everyone has equal opportunities and etc. That that's the founding myth of this country. And when you start digging a little deeper, you see that I saw that it's never been that. It is never that that is a total myth. It has never been that way. <laughs> and so um, it threatens to undermine yourself, your sense of self. And in my own journey, what I had to do was to create a new sense of self. And I had to let the old self, the one who was, I was born on the 4th of July. So the one who was brought up with the firecrackers and the patriotic parades and the whole narrative as a, as a point of identity and pride, I had to let that self die and I had to let a new self emerge. And the new self that emerged in my case, and it's probably different for everybody, everybody has their own story that can emerge. But in my case, it had to do with connection to my ancestors. And so I began learning about them, who they were before they came over here and colonized. I found out about the beauty of everything that they carried for millennia, you know, and the fact that they were colonized first. That's where this pattern of colonization and intergenerational harm came from. It started in Europe with all of our people doing it to each other, with thousands of years of war, of hierarchy, of patriarchy, of power over, of religious conversion, you name it, of land enclosures and land theft. All of that happened amongst our people. So once, and then it became like a template to do it over here it became, it was like all of the, all of those thousands of years became condensed into a super efficient program of genocide that was enacted on this continent. And so once I began to see the longer arc of history, I could let my former self die and it wasn't threatening anymore. And that's my hope for us as people that we can find the strength to do that and find the support to do that because the way I see it is, you know, we have to, we have to find a new story and we have to create new identities right now that are connected to the earth, that are connected to the past, that are connected to the future generation, that are sustainable and equitable and harmonious because we're, we're on a really uh, dangerous spiral right now that's not doing that. And we've got we've to gotta build something else. We've got to build another culture, another sense of identity. So that's, that's been really my strength is, is, you know, working with my ancestors and understanding what happened to them. Yeah, what comes to mind in, in hearing you speak about it is that you've chosen a path of depth. Um, to me, it feels like the 4th of July, although I'm glad that it's your birthday. Um, but, you know, many people don't even really know anything about the history of that holiday. You know, it, it's, it's become very hollow, a very shallow. Um, you know, maybe there's some ritual around fireworks or a parade, but there's no depth of knowing or, or culture or you know, they're underneath all of that. And, and so I just get this sense in hearing you speak about it, you know, choosing this path of depth, um, following the lines back um, and doing this tremendous learning while also connecting, you know, and receiving support too in, in, a, in many ways. So um, yeah, that, 
listening to you talk about the this death of the former self, um, the death of so many things that we learn in school and, um, you know, if from, from all sorts of places in our culture. And um, it, it's exciting in many ways to feel like there's all sorts of possibility of reinvention, of getting to choose what we, where we're finding meaning and, and value um, and choosing in a different way than before. So, yeah, once in a while, I'll entirely fall off track. You know, every once in a while, I'll be like, oh, I'm so lost, you know, without, even with all the support. Um, you know, every once in a while, I'll have a day where it's just really hard to, you know, without the sadness of not having that scaffolding, that deep, um, like being raised within the, a rich culture of, of knowing that it is a new sun every day, you know, with, without that, um, I, I like that cradle of support in view of the world. Sometimes it can feel um, pretty lonely, you know, pretty, you know, you, every once in a while you sort of fall off and you're like, whoa, where, where am I? And then, you know, you sort of like tether back in and um, remember our interconnectedness. Um, so I, I'm hearing yeah. rumors of people wanting to, <laughs> to reinvent Independence Day to uh, Interdependence Day instead and, and see if that takes off. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's, I've decided to call it myself. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, because, yeah. yeah, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add to that or... Um, well, I just wanted to, to echo and re reflect what you said that about, you know, there's like a poverty that's, that we've inherited as white people in this culture. We've inherited a lot of privilege, a lot of advantages, a lot of things that other people don't get, but we've also inherited a poverty because we don't have those roots. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the deep cultural support of the interconnected nature of reality, you know, and here we are trying to trying to remember, right? And trying to grow those roots in our families and our communities. And yet our larger culture doesn't really get that, you know? So I just affirm what you said. And, you know, I want to say too that I hope that, you know, we can start showing up for each other in that way to remind each other, create it together, you know? And that's just a hope that I hold that, you know, that we can begin to, to re it's really a remembering. It's not a, it's not an invention. It's not something new. It's just a remembering of who we are and where we came from. Cause all people had that at one time, you know, I totally, totally agree. And every part of my embodied self knows that to be true but see how easy it is to forget. Like even in my verbiage, I was like, oh, there's something to, you know, it's a, there, there's, uh, you know, thinking about sort of a new story of sorts. Um, but you're, I agree entirely that it is, there isn't actually, none of it is, is really new. It is a deep remembering within ourselves because it is there. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, in your, in your meditations and explorations of what it means to be a good relative, I'm just curious, you know, if there are any, um, any things in particular that have arisen in this journey for you? Totally, yes. One of the biggest things that has emerged out of all this quiet, introspective, ancestral, internal stuff the spiraling outward of that is the path of reparations for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, a, a few years ago came across the concept of making a personal reparations plan. And I have been working on that and helping others do that as well. And it's really 
deer, it's a deer practice to me and really important. Um, so, you know, everybody has something in their, you know, in their family history, in their interests, in their gifts, in their financial situation, in their geographical location, etc. All of these elements combine to produce, there's something that's a perfect fit for us to do or to give in the way of reparations. And, um, you know, for me, that focuses a lot. I, I focus a lot of my energy into, you know, indigenous led work that's focusing on human rights, protection of sacred landscape, et cetera. And I also support, you know, programming, especially in the South that supports black women and black women's healing and maternal health and community spaces, because that's where my ancestors enslaved people in Mississippi. So it's like my story is what lays, makes the blueprint for my reparations plan. And that's kind of what I try to, you know, encourage people to do too. Um, there's also, there are also land tax programs that are springing up all over the country. I have a list of them on my website and that is kind of a game changer in my mind because it changes the, the settler narrative that we are entitled to land. And it changes the narrative into, we are all living on indigenous land and we can be in reciprocity with the indigenous communities where we live and, and we, can, um, we can voluntarily offer contributions to support them. And, and that's how we begin building relationship and we begin building trust. So all of that is really important for my understanding of what it means to be a good relative. And, um, you know, I also see just, I'm connected in with a lot of networks around this and I, this is just taking off around the country and it's so heartening. Like reparations, maybe someday our government will get it together. <laughs> and agree on something, but in case they don't, or in case it takes them a really long time, each one of us can begin taking these steps now of what I, it's what I call repaying the unpayable debt because well, we can't fix it, but we can try to reduce the harm of what's happened. And the trying is actually the the trying is the healing, you know, it's kind of a paradox in my experience. So. Thank you. Yeah. It, it comes to mind that you, in knowing your story, as well as you do, like in knowing, in having done that work of tracing back your ancestry, I mean, many people don't know much about their ancestral lines. Um, so I, I love the way you're allowing that to guide you, you know, to follow the organicness of that um, and to move with it as a, as a, a guide in, in where to bring your attention. So, um, yeah. Well, and I also want to say too, that, you know, like you said, not everybody knows their ancestral lines and that's okay. Not everybody is descended from people who colonized or enslaved, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And but it we can do it anyway, mm -hmm. right? Because even to be you know fair complected and white identified like this in this country, regardless of what our ancestors did, is still incredibly privileged. And so, you know, and anybody can do it, and it can take a million different forms. So. Um, I also have a, a guide to making a personal reparations plan. That's It's just a Google doc. It's up on my website. Anybody's welcome to look at it. It's full of resources and ideas and can be a really beautiful process to do that with our family or our friends or our community so that it becomes a cultural shift mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of talking about reparations, normalizing them and making them a part of just what we do, what we all do. Uh-huh. 
Oh, I'm so glad that you shared that resource with us. That's great. Um, I hope everybody is able to, to take a look at it and use it. Um, yeah. Well, I'm wondering if there are any um, special projects or maybe that you wanted to tell us about or maybe tell us a little bit more about your book that you've been working on. Um, yeah, what's, what's brewing lately for you? Well, I'm, I'm definitely working on that book as much as I can. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of editing with an editor and I'm gonna start looking for a publisher, hopefully in the fall. And um, so that's really alive. And, you know, also, I would also say too that, um, you know, if, if there's anyone who wants to be in support of changing the name of Agassiz Peak at the federal level, mm. please feel free to email me because um, we're collecting statements of support. We have to apply at the federal level to the uh, Board of Geographic Names. And I think the more support we can show from around the country, the more likely it is that that, um, you know, that application will be accepted. And, you know, this is really the vision of Danae and Hopi youth who they need to have the name of that mountain changed so that they can feel whole and complete in who they are mm. because she's their grandmother. She mm -hmm. shouldn't have the name of a racist white male scientist in her. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just would invite that. And uh, there's always a lot of projects moving here. <laughs> but those are the two that are on the top of my mind right now. Thank you. Yeah. Well, names are so important. It means so much. It's really easy to take that for granted. Um, but there is, I think, in, in tuning into what this is, this is a, like the microcosm of the macrocosm of colonialist um, imprints left like on all these sacred spaces um, ev everywhere. So, you know, I think that um, one little victory and then hopefully, you know, it gains in consciousness more and more. That's the hope. Yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah, it's it is a real how we name things could be a real game changer for sure over the long term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I just so appreciate you devoting yourself, using your life's energy in this way, Hillary. And I'm just so honored to get to share this time with you. I really, really appreciate all your thoughts and wisdom. And um, it's been wonderful. Oh, thank you, Kendra. I appreciate you too. And I'm really curious to, to learn more about your work too. I, I think we have a lot of threads in common, mm -hmm. the little bit that I've, I've read so far. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Lots, thank of, you. lots of overlap. Yes. Yeah. Well, much gratitude to everyone listening for spending this time with us and for being willing to push up against your edges a little bit, to get a little bit uncomfortable as we find new ways of relating and being in kinship, all the while bringing our open armed devotion and adoration and love for this beautiful wild earth. Bye for now.